Hello and welcome to this first video in which we will um, lead to um, the use of Octave as a programming language in solving engineering problems. So I'm going to uh, go through a few things today. First, I want to um, introduce you to something known as the Internet of Things and then give you an example, a few examples rather, of uh, data and modeling that are relevant to engineering applications and then we will uh, introduce um, Octave, which is a high-level engineering programming language. So let's begin with information and data. Um, I would like to start with uh, giving you a sense of something known as the computational power of a computer. Okay. Uh, you may have heard of uh, a supercomputer. A supercomputer is basically a very powerful computer in the context of the fact that it can perform many different uh, or many operations per second. So a typical way in which the power of a supercomputer is measured is known as flops. And flops measure how many uh, floating point operations the computer can do per second. So on the x-axis here is time in years. And on the y-axis is the flops uh, that a computer can achieve, a supercomputer can achieve. And as you can see, right now we are in, um, in, in, a, in a time period where the computational power seems to be uh, increasing almost exponentially. Right? So that, what does that tell us? It tells us that, for example, uh, your cell phone is now extremely powerful in the context of the number of operations it can perform as compared to maybe a desktop or PC, you know, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Okay. So that is what is meant by computational power. Now the reason computational power is going up is uh, because of something uh, known as the shrinking of the number of transistors you can put uh, on an area. So that means size of the transistor is going down and uh, a one way that this can be visualized is something known as the Moore's law which on the y-axis plots the number of transistors per unit area and on the x-axis is uh, time in years. It turns out that every two years the number of transistors you can put on per unit area is doubling and so you see a, a straight line here on a log linear plot or a semi-log plot okay, as we discussed uh, uh, as, and we will be using the semi-log plot later on when we talk about function discovery. So the bottom line here is that computational power is increasing tremendously and what this is doing is that it's leading to a new reality in which the ability to gather and process data is becoming ubiquitous. That means pretty much every machine that an engineer is thinking about is now linked to be able to uh, gathering data and utilizing that data. And that brings us to something known as the Internet of Things. Uh, or in short form, it's also known as IoT. So what is the Internet of Things? So if you look at this image here, you can uh, basically see that every device that we uh, have lying around the home or that we see you know, when you drive on the highway, things like that, is now getting connected to the Internet. Whether it is you know, uh, a piece of farm equipment, obviously your cell phone, you know, uh, uh, your car, uh, even things like a doggy collar could be connected to the internet, uh, uh, household appliances, for example a refrigerator shown here, uh, washing machine, uh, even things like uh, you know um, the thermostat setting on your home, all those things are now getting connected to the internet. Okay? And and what, what this is is that uh, increasingly uh, machines basically are getting uh, closer and closer to being softwares that are being run by sensors and actuators uh, attached to them. Okay. Uh, for example, you can think of the Tesla car. Uh, these days you can actually upgrade your car by just getting a software upgrade and that was something that was unimaginable before the time that uh, we had uh, data that we could gather and send to our machines. And so this is the Internet of Things, the fact that everything that you think about is actually connected to the Internet and that you can interact with it through the Internet. By the way, just to uh, tell you a little bit more about what a sensor and an actuator is, 
Um, a good example to start looking for sensors uh, are, uh, uh, is actually your cell phone. Uh, there are many different sensors on your cell phone. And what does a sensor do? Well, a sensor is a device or a machine uh, whose purpose is to detect events or changes in the environment and send that information to, uh, to your computer, right? And this information is first processed by some electronics and then it, is, uh, then it is sent to your computer and that can appear as data that then can be uh, you know, turned out into, for example, uh, a weather app or, uh, or, or, or something else, right? An actuator is actually a component of a machine that is responsible for moving and controlling systems. Uh, for example, it can open a valve or close a valve. And so unlike a sensor, it actually uh, does some kind of mechanical uh, function inside your, uh, inside your machine. Yeah. Okay. So to get you warmed up with you know, what sensors are, um, I provided you a link here that lists many different types of sensors in a phone. And go ahead and read, that, uh, read the information on that link. And then see if you can uh, complete this uh, little activity here where you match the type of sensor to its function. For example, a GPS, an accelerometer, a magnetometer, and so on, to what it actually does in your cell phone. As you can see, you know, I've listed seven sensors here, but there are actually even more sensors on your cell phone. Okay, let's go to uh, the next topic, which is uh, modeling. Okay, what is modeling? So let's begin with this question of, uh, you know, uh, the fact that how do engineers uh, predict behavior? Another way is, you know, if you dream up a gadget you would like to make, how do you know it's going to work, right? And, and so this is one of the fundamental tasks of an engineer. You may be involved with designing and creating new products, and the critical question that, uh, that you will need to answer is that how do you know uh, what you make is going to work as it was intended to? Well, so engineers uh, address this question in two ways. Right? First is you can create a model that is either a real model, either a full scale or you know a, a, a smaller scale model, or you can also create this model on a computer. Right? And then the next step is to test the model, either the real full scale model or uh, a, a small scale model or the computer model that you have created. And once it passes these steps where uh, you see that your model actually functions like you had intended to, then you can go ahead and create, uh, you know, create the actual, uh, um, actual device, right? Now, it turns out that using modeling um, uh, via a computer in which you can both do design as well as the modeling aspect of it, it can save you a lot of resources and also reduce the time to discovery, okay? And so uh, that is why it has become very important that all engineers have a sound fundamental understanding of computing uh, techniques, especially those that are focused on solving engineering problems. So here's another example of, of, uh, of the modeling behavior, but uh, in, in a context of discovering the behavior of, uh, of a given engineering system. The function discovery is the term that is used to, uh, to describe the process of finding a mathematical function that describes a particular behavior. Right? So think about uh, the experiment that you did in your first measurements lab where you measured uh, the linear dimension of a balloon to its, uh, to its volume uh, under expansion. And you came up with an expression you came up with the data that uh, relates the, the linear dimension to the volume, and then you used curve fitting to find the function that describes that behavior. That's exactly what uh, function discovery is. It's gathering the data and then finding the function that uh, describes the behavior. If you did the same experiment with, uh, with a spring mass system, what you would have found is that uh, the extension of the spring as a function of the mass you put on here is going to give you uh, a linear result. And this is known as Hooke's law. And that means the extension y in the spring is going to be directly proportional to the, the load that you applied, which is measured by the weight. 
and that linear curve might have a, a slope uh, given by m which is uh, known as the spring constant and an intercept b right? and so this is uh, this is the uh, uh, process of uh, discovering the behavior of an engineering system you make measurements and then you fit uh, the data to a function and that function describes how the system behaves okay. here's another example uh, and this is known as signal processing so what is signal processing well let's just first think about what a signal is it turns out that you know every field of engineering utilizes signals of various kinds right? uh, some of you may be familiar with this uh, with this image here um, it's actually from uh, a very well-known uh, movie known as the matrix and what you're seeing here is you know uh, um, a, a, a depiction of data that is buried inside uh, all kinds of noise and so the ability to see this uh, relevant data in the noise is central to something known as signal processing right so think about uh, the different types of signals we have around us we have electromagnetic signal in the form of radio waves uh, uh, you know uh, tv uh, uh, the, the the electromagnetic waves that carry the tv signals wi-fi inside our home radar that helps to you know guide uh, uh, guide planes um, you can think of electrical signals such as the current that flows from from the wall to to your device, um, uh, the power lines that carry power to our homes, uh, switches that are switching uh, things on and off. Right? You can think of uh, sound signals, audio communication, sonar detection. Uh, you also have signals in terms of heat, magnetism, pressure, humidity, and so on and so forth. So it turns out that virtually everything we do in engineering is ultimately interacting with, uh, uh, requires us to interact with, you know, uh, the surrounding, and that interaction is done in the form of uh, uh, information. Uh, in the, uh, that that interaction is done in the form of uh, accessing a signal, and so the information the devices may be gathering are in the form of signals, and these signals need to be processed so that uh, your device or your computer can understand what's going on. So it turns out that signal processing is uh, is actually uh, by itself a career choice, uh, and so I would urge you to click on this uh, video link here uh, from your uh, slides and uh, do look up that video that explains to you what a career in signal processing uh, might uh, might look like. Right? So here's an example of signal processing in the context of something known as machine learning, which is fundamental to robotics, right? So one of the most common types of signals that we are familiar with are images. You know, we read uh, uh, images with our brain by our, uh, through our eyesight that are captured through our eyesight, you know, or captured through the camera uh, or, or through our TV screen. And so images are amongst the most common types of signals uh, we, are, uh, we are familiar with. Okay. Now here's an example of how signal processing of images can lead to robotics or machine learning uh, applications. So machine learning is basically the process in which a computer improves its ability to uh, carry out a particular task by data that it is uh, getting and then comparing the data to uh, an output result and then based on the validity of the output result it can learn to improve its, uh, its outcome. Okay. Think about an example here where you want to calculate the number of automobiles that cross uh, a particular bridge on a daily basis. So you can estimate, for example, uh, the wear and tear on the road, the load that the bridge is exposed to, and things like that that are relevant for engineering applications. Well, obviously it's a very tedious task to have it done by a manual process, right? So then what you think about is, okay, let me put a camera out there and let me capture each of those cars. Right? Well, you've captured tons and tons of images now, or tons and tons of uh, video recordings, and now you have to sit and go through each of these recordings. Well, that's still a very tedious task. But now imagine if you can actually have a computer program that can automatically identify each of these vehicles and then count them for you, and then you check, you know, randomly keep checking to see the validity of these, uh, of these uh, results to make sure that your computer program is working well. 
Well, that's exactly what um, what one potential application of signal processing is. Uh, and in fact, this kind of application is also fundamental to machine learning because you're training the computer over time to do a better and better job at identifying exactly what is the car and what is not so that its results are accurate. Right? So uh, again, fundamentally, uh, this activity relies on being able to do, uh, able to use a computer to do the analysis and provide the outcomes. Okay? So once again, we see that com learning to use a computer, especially, uh, especially uh, computer technologies that can allow us to do these kind of applications, um, uh, is going to be a very important skill set for you to develop as an engineer. So with that, let me uh, introduce you to Octave. Okay. So what is new Octave? Uh, well, it is a high level mathematical programming language. right? And when I say high level, it means that basically when you uh, write uh, information that can be accessed by this programming language, it is being written in simple English-like syntax. Okay? Uh, unlike uh, something that is a low-level language where you uh, need to have a very specialized form of interaction with the computer through uh, a specific set of commands. So here, you're really interacting with the computer through uh, language that looks like writing English sentences. And, and so that makes life a lot easier in terms of writing scripts. New Octave is designed for engineers to solve numerical problems, perform you know, data signal and image analysis, visualize data through graphics, perform modeling and simulations, things like that. So as an example here, uh, here's an output of a typical uh, a modeling um, uh, code. The code is kind of shown here, and it is uh, it is basically describing how a virus can grow in a certain population, given uh, given some uh, underlying conditions for its growth rate and the amount of people in the in in the population, things like that. And so the code uh, sets up you know your model, and once you run the code, it outputs this graphical output. So this is something that you might, you know, think of as a typical uh, way to use uh, GNU Octave to carry out, you know, certain computations and modeling so you can uh, predict what might happen. For example, in the case of COVID-19, you can then predict what's likely to happen uh, as a function of time under certain conditions. The good news is that this, uh, uh, this uh, programming language is free and open source, so it can be installed on any operating system by anybody. And, and so uh, you don't have to uh, pay for it, which is a very good thing. Right? Now, MATLAB, which is the proprietary version of Octave, or rather I should say that Octave is a free open source version of MATLAB, uh, is identical to Octave. Uh, so it's also a high level and a very powerful programming language. And lots of tasks can be automated. Now, these uh, programming languages are not like Excel. Okay, they are much more powerful. They can handle uh, large amounts of data and, and do a lot of things that Excel cannot uh, come close to doing. Right? Uh, MATLAB requires a license. And so typically, uh, you know, once you are in your four-year college, you might actually have to pay for it to use it. But the good news is that you can do everything that MATLAB does uh, pretty much by using the free open source version, which is Octave. Now, there's some weaknesses of Octave and MATLAB. One is that they tend to be slow, and, and that's because uh, these are high-level languages, so many additional steps are needed before the computer can actually understand what you're saying. Right? And it does take a much longer time to become an expert on things like MATLAB and Octave as compared to using spreadsheets. The good news is that you are actually learning a new language, and this can appear on your, on your CV, and is a powerful, powerful tool uh, not only during your engineering education, but also as you go beyond into the engineering world. Yeah. So let's get started. First, make sure you install GNU Octave. You know, I've uh, provided the link here for a website. Uh, please make sure that you install it. And once it's installed, uh, when you run it, you should be able to see a command window that appears that looks like this. Right? So if you've reached this stage, then congratulations. We are ready to uh, actually explore Octave, uh, which we will do in the next lesson. Okay. So please uh, make sure you get Octave installed. 
uh, we are going to be using the book by Campbell which is available to you uh, via Canvas um, and please do uh, start out on reading that book so that you can get a head start. Thank you.